Well, the U.S. has imposed new sanctions on companies from Russian and China areas for assisting North Korea in violating international sanctions. According to the U.S. Treasury, the companies have helped North Korea make over a billion dollars a year on illegal cigarettes, among other products. Well, joining us now, CBS News State Department reporter Kylie Atwood. Kylie, what more do we know about these sanctions that were imposed today? Yeah, so these sanctions are targeting uh, entities that are Russian and Chinese entities that are supporting North Korea in terms of services and shipments into the country. So they have to do with things, as you mentioned, cigarettes that are going into North Korea, mm -hmm. tobacco-related products, also alcohol and oil. That's mm -hmm. the key here. Um, Ambassador Haley has forever said that oil is the lifeline mm -hmm. of North Korea. It allows them co to continue carrying out their nuclear program. So these sanctions are going after these Russian and Chinese entities that are violating the U.N. and U.S. sanctions that are already in place. So, Kylie, what do you read into the fact that these sanctions are being put place as they're trying to do negotiations? Is it sort of dead on arrival now, these talks? Well, that's a great question. Earlier this year, uh, President Trump declared that the U.S. had hundreds of sanctions that it mm -hmm. could be putting on North Korea, but it was holding off because the two countries were talking nicely, his words, mm -hmm. not mine. And so now it kind of appears we have this round of sanctions. We had some sanctions earlier in August. Uh, the talks aren't going as nicely as he would have hoped, or they wouldn't be putting these sanctions on. And it's yet to be seen how the U.S. and North Korea can continue talking if the U.S. continues putting on more sanctions, because diplomats have long said that that's not the way to to keep these folks at the table. Yeah. Also talking about keeping folks at the table, everyone has said China has a great role in getting North Korea there. Have we heard from China about these new sanctions and, and what's the take on that? Not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, China is probably going to come out very frustrated. You know, they say that they are doing a lot to push North Korea to the table. And truth be told, the U.S. really needs China to continue pressuring North Korea because they do the most trade yeah. with that country. They're right along their border. They have a lot of clout. So the interesting thing to watch is how China reacts and if China is still committed to working with the U.S. as it has been uh, in the past. And they've got their own trade issues with the U.S. at this point, too, so it's fascinating to exactly. see how it all pans right. out. I do want to ask you about Secretary of State Pompeo because at one point the North Koreans accused him of making gangster-like demands. That was their words, right? So is he headed back anytime soon? So we have not confirmed that Pompeo is going back to North Korea, but we heard Ambassador Bolton say that he is offered to go back to North Korea. So we know it's coming sometime in the near future here. But we also heard Ambassador Bolton earlier this month say that North Korea hasn't taken any steps to denuclearize. And that's the truth, right? Uh, last trip, uh, as you mentioned, Pompeo's trip to North Korea didn't go so well. He was stood up by Kim Jong-un, who he expected to meet. He didn't meet with him. He didn't walk away with any tangible, concrete steps on denuclearization from North Korea, you know, there's still talks going on and the State Department says that that's sign of progress. That's uh, forward movement from where we were six mm -hmm. months ago or a year ago. But then again, we still don't have any concrete steps on denuclearization, which is the ultimate goal for the Trump administration. Yeah, nothing in hand from that except a bill. They gave him a bill for his dining services and his time in North Korea, slightly odd. You we've know? got letters going back and forth. We've got yeah. you know, prisoner remains, which right. is some, some progress right. here. Right. Uh, we have them destroying a missile launch test site. That's some progress. But then again, all of these things don't have to do directly with denuclearization. Mm. I do want to ask you about Pompeo's counterpart, North Korea. We know that he's a spy. He's not really a trained diplomat. What else do we know about him? And is he a key figure? And, and can he really sort of make some change or, or movement in this. Yeah, so Kim Young-chol is someone who is known to be a little bit tough on the negotiating front. There are other North Koreans who Americans that have negotiated with North Korea would rather sit down with. Mm -hmm. They speak English uh, more fluently. They know the issues a little bit more. And Kim Young-chol has been someone who's been tough uh, to sit across the table with for American negotiators. I also want to point out, though, that this negotiating has started at the top, right? We saw mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un and mm -hmm. President Trump meet. That makes it a little bit harder for the diplomats at the lower levels. Ambassador Sung Kim uh, went to North Korea to lay the groundwork for some of these meetings. And I was told by a diplomat from the region that they asked 
asked him what he was doing there. Now, the State Department uh, spokesperson, Heather Nauert, told me that she, she hadn't heard that and that wasn't how she would characterize the meetings. But it hasn't been easy for the people at the lower levels because Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un and Kim Young-chol, the guys at the top, are talking with the top counterparts mm. to try and get something happening. You know what's fascinating me about this story, Kylie, is there have been so many people who have for years made a career out of trying to do negotiations with the North Koreans. And every time we've had these folks on, they've been like, we support the president. We, we, we think that there could be an opportunity. There could be a window here. They're not actually bashing President Trump on this, but it just seems like that window and that level of optimism is sort of the, the balloon is being deflated day by day as this goes on. Yeah, I mean, initially we saw uh, President Trump when he was talking about denuclearization. Um, he said he had heard horror stories of denuclearization lasting, yeah. taking 15 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, initially he wanted this to happen really quickly. Then uh, later this summer we saw him come out and say it might take a little bit longer. But State Department officials are now telling uh, Trump supporters in the foreign policy world that they're not willing to wait for a long time in this same status that they're in right now. They don't want to be where they are right now a year from now. Mm. They want there to be progress quickly or they want to fail quickly so that they can move on and put their efforts diplomatically towards other foreign policy issues. And is the administration telegraphing what they'll do if Plan A fails? They're not, but what we are hearing is folks in the region encouraging them not to step away. Yeah. I met with the South Korean ambassador to the U.S. last week, and he said there's no alternative. Mm. You know, so the U.S. stops talking to North Korea, they build up their nuclear program, then what? We're in mm -hmm. a much worse place. So he wants the momentum to keep going on, and the U.S. is listening to those voices, but, you know, we have a president who's not really known for being a very patient person, yeah. especially when it comes to diplomacy. Yeah, he's certainly got that gut check that he likes to just use on a, on a five. Uh, yeah. I want to thank you so much, Kylie, for joining us. Thanks. Yep.